Salutations. Aristotle was a follower of Plato, having studied at his academy for 20 years. When Plato died, Speusippus succeeded him as the academy's scholarch, and Aristotle immediately left, possibly anticipating the future direction of academic scepticism. He became a private tutor for several students, including Alexander the Great, before returning to Athens. There, he founded his own school at the Temple to Apollo, which was called the Lyceum in honour of Apollo Lyceus, or Apollo the Wolf. Unfortunately, after the death of Aristotle's successor, Theophrastus, the peripatetic school collapsed in on itself like a failed souffle. The successors of Theophrastus were uninterested in first philosophy, and spent their time recording compilations of facts rather than actually thinking about anything. What's a dragonfly? What do they taste like? Dragonflies. During this time, the Stoics and Epicureans enjoyed the highest prestige among schools, deservedly so for the former, and unaccountably so for the latter. When the Romans conquered Athens, they brought the surviving works of Aristotle and Theophrastus to Rome, where they were used for education. A new peripatetic school was founded there by Andronicus. This didn't have much of an impact at the time, since the Romans mainly preferred Stoicism, but it will be important later. The revival of Platonism in the 3rd century included the study of other philosophical traditions through a Platonic lens. None of the Platonists during this period saw any serious conflict between Plato and Aristotle. They treated them as in general agreement. I'm down with Plato and Socrates, and I like to get busy with all the ladies. Plotinus freely incorporated peripatetic material into his Enneads. Porphyry does not seem to have held serious opposition towards Aristotle either. One of his surviving works is the Isagogue, an introduction to the categories that clearly shows an admiration for Aristotle's logic. Iamblichus created an educational system mirroring initiatic mystery schools, in which Aristotle's works are the lesser mysteries that provide a foundation for understanding, while Plato's works are the greater mysteries that contain the advanced knowledge. At this point, Stoicism was losing its appeal, and Roman education had Aristotle's logic at its foundation. This means that Latin-speaking Christians were familiar with peripatetic education, and understood ancient philosophy mainly through the lens of Aristotle. Since Aristotle was always vague when he wrote about the gods, it was quite easy to replace his divinity with the Nicene Chalcedonian godhead. This is why scholasticism is basically just peripateticism, with Catholicism stapled to it. During the Middle Ages, the only work of Plato that was widely available in the Latin world was the Timaeus. They also had no Plotinus, no Iamblichus, and all they had from Porphyry was the Isagogue. In the Eastern Empire, mystical texts were popular among theologians, like those of Pseudo-Dionysius, who was copying Proclus's homework. All this means that there was tension between the subtle Platonic influence on Greek Orthodoxy, and the very obvious Peripatetic influence on Latin Catholicism. Into this mix was thrown a man called Gemistus Plethon. Oh my god, it's him, he's here, it's real! Who's that? He was a scholar in the Byzantine Empire who reintroduced the study of Plato to the West, when he went to Italy for the Council of Florence. One of the books he wrote was called On the Differences Between Plato and Aristotle, or De Differentiis for short, or DD for even shorter. D is about as short as you can go, or maybe... D. In this book, Plathon argued that Plato was better suited to Christianity than Aristotle was. Now, considering that Plathon was secretly a heathen who wanted to overthrow Christianity and replace it with the worship of Zeus and Poseidon, this was obviously not what he actually believed. Instead, he was just trying to trick everyone into studying Plato by appealing to their interests. This is the origin of the belief that Aristotle and Plato are significantly opposed to one another. Since Plathon was instrumental in starting the Renaissance, this notion became the dominant perception of the two philosophers in the Latin West and continues to this day. Even Hegel claimed that Plotinus couldn't have been a good representative of Plato because he was too heavily influenced by Aristotle. Now, does this mean that I think there are no differences between the two philosophers? No. Let's have a look at the commonly proposed divergences and see which of them constitute a real opposition and which do not. By the way, here are the sources I'm using, you should read them. The most often proclaimed divergence is with regard to the theory of forms. As it is usually told, Plato believed in a transcendent world of forms separate from the material world, while Aristotle believed that forms exist in material objects and are dependent on them. This is wrong. 
Aristotle never says anything to the effect that forms are dependent on their instances. He explicitly argues against this position in the posterior analytics. The old man never said that. Now you can't flash back to something that never happened. That's not fair. In fact, to admit such a thing would completely destroy his entire metaphysical system, since it would require either the actual to proceed from the potential without an actualizing agent, or an ontologically infinite series of causes. It would also mean that there is no such thing as a formal cause, since forms wouldn't cause anything if they came from their instances rather than produced them. The term that Aristotle uses that is translated as form is morphe, while the term Plato uses is eidos. The primary characteristic of Aristotle's morphi is that they, along with matter, constitute sensible objects. The primary characteristic of Plato's Aide is that they are intelligible beings which are the objects of intellection and are the paradigms by which subsequent things are cognizable. These are evidently different things altogether, and they do not serve the same explanatory function. So what does Aristotle have that serves the explanatory function of Plato's Aide? The highest principle in the peripatetic system is the intellect, or nous, which is understood to be purely actual, non-spatio-temporal, and cognitively identical with the objects of its intellection, the intelligible essences, or noeta. Aristotle's gods are the individual prime movers of which the intellect is the principle, and in which the celestial spheres participate with their motions. In De Anima, Aristotle uses the term eidos as synonymous with noeton. The term noeta was also used by Platonists as synonymous with eide. So Aristotle's noeta serve the function of Plato's forms. What then does Plato have that serves the same explanatory function as Aristotle's morphi? In the Phaedo and the Parmenides, Plato distinguishes between the forms within objects and the forms themselves by themselves. For example, he speaks of greatness as exemplified in extended bodies You're a big guy! Yeah. and of the great itself. The latter are the Aide, properly speaking, imparticipable intelligible essences, while the latter are the forms as participated. Proclus refers to the latter as unmattered forms. So we can see both the Morphi and the Aide represented in each system presented under slightly different terms. The difference is semantic. So why does Aristotle present an attack against a theory of forms in the metaphysics? Well, he's just following Plato. The Parmenides contains the deconstruction of a naive theory of forms proposed by a young Socrates, followed by a robust and rigorous formulation of first principles by Parmenides. The naive theory that Plato rejects strongly resembles the theory attacked by Aristotle in the metaphysics. Aristotle even uses the exact same argument that Plato does, the third man argument. Aristotle seems to think that Plato has not adequately responded to the problem, not that Plato has failed to recognize the problem in the first place. Aristotle's response is to have Morphi as participables and Noeta as paradigms, while the Platonic response is to have Enmattered Aide as participables and Intelligible Aide as paradigms. Furthermore, several of Aristotle's criticisms are of conceptions that are never actually attributed to Plato himself. Considering that he left the academy when Speusippus assumed leadership, it is just as likely that he and the other academics are the ones being criticised for not understanding forms. The fact that Aristotle had set up his own school in opposition to the academy is also a factor to consider. He would certainly have wanted to show that his own understanding of forms was superior to that of the academics. Now let's look at what Gemistus Plathon considers to be the main differences between the two. After all, he wrote the book on the subject. The first is with regards to the univocity of being. Univocity, as in one voice, means that every time you say a word you mean the same thing. The opposite is equivocity, which does not mean horse voice. I love it! Basically, if we say that being is univocal, we mean that everything that has being has it in the same way. The being of a chair is the same sort of thing as the being of a lamppost. If we affirm, then, that mathematical objects have some sort of being, it must be the same sort of being that material objects have. The same also goes for mental concepts and other things. They may participate in being to different degrees, X having more being than Y, but what X has lots of is the same thing as what Y has a little of. 
On the other hand, if being is equivocal, then when we say the chair has being, we mean something fundamentally different to when we say that a mathematical has being. For Plato, being is a single great genus which encompasses all essences, and in which generated things participate to some greater or lesser degree. For Aristotle, each of the ten categories exists in its own distinct sense which is irreconcilable with the others. Platon correctly identifies this as a real primary difference between the two philosophers. You're right. It's fact. The second most important difference that Platon asserts regards theology. According to Platon, Aristotle treats God only as an impersonal mechanistic principle, whereas Plato discusses gods at length. Platon claims that this is an intentional rejection of divine providence on Aristotle's part. I disagree. Considering how little Aristotle discusses the gods compared to Plato, it's far more likely that he focuses on mechanical operations because mechanical operations are what interest him. We wouldn't say that a historian rejects the theories of a computer scientist just because he doesn't discuss them. In an entirely different sense, however, Platon is absolutely correct that Aristotle and Plato have different theologies. You're right again. Without realising it though, Platon in fact stands firmly on Aristotle's side of the argument. Not this time. In case you've forgotten or zoned out, Aristotle's first principle is the purely actual principle of intellect. This corresponds to the first aspect of Proclus's intellectual triad. Aristotle does not think it proper to place anything prior to being, and neither does Platon. Thus, Platon's one, his form of the good, is the one being. This puts Platon at odds not only with Plotinus, Iamblichus, Proclus, and Damasius, but also with a face value reading of the dialogues. In the Republic, it is stated plainly that the good is prior to being. Aristotle does not produce an articulated response to the problem of the one and the many, but in his work it is implicit that over each genus of things stands a singular principle. He even quotes Homer to that effect when discussing the gods. He never applies this to the genus of individual things or entities, which would produce a supra-essential principle of unity. To summarise, Aristotle's gods are contemplative intellects who are cognitively identical with their content, the intelligible essences. According to Platon, it is the intelligible essences which are the gods' simpliciter, with intellection as a self-reflexive activity. According to Iamblichus and Proclus, the intelligible essences are primary gods because their unities are henads, which are themselves the gods' simpliciter. The intellects are angels by the reckoning of Iamblichus. Next there is the matter of the soul. Aristotle defines soul as the form or actuality of living creatures. He considers there to be three kinds or aspects of soul. These are the vegetative soul, which governs consumption, growth, and reproduction. They're eating her! The animal soul, which governs motion and instinctive behaviours. And the rational soul, which governs reason and abstract thinking. These correspond, though not exactly, with Plato's tripartite soul consisting of the epithumeticon, which governs base reproductive and consumptive impulse, the thumoides, which governs emotions and spirit, and the logisticon, which governs reason and dialectical thought. Sometimes if you listen very carefully, you can hear my genius. According to Aristotle, some aspects of the soul are inseparable from their operations on bodies, while he compares the rational soul to the pilot of a ship. He further states that the speculative faculty is of a different kind from the lower animating type of soul. In fact, it belongs in a passive capacity to the order of intellect, receiving its powers from the supra-rational active intellect. This is called the noeron in Platonism, the point at which the soul and intellect convene. This makes it, in Aristotle's words, immortal and eternal. Plotinus argues against Aristotle's initial definition of soul as inadequate, and with the analogy of the pilot in the ship as incomplete, he agrees, however, with the basic structure laid out by Aristotle. With all this covered, I think we can draw a fairly strong conclusion. While Aristotle set himself in opposition to the academics, and tried to revise Platonism with his characteristic form of analysis, his worldview in the end was far closer to that of Plato than is widely appreciated, and the two can coexist harmoniously when their actual differences are understood and accounted for. Thanks for watching, and have a nice day.